Today's topic is church membership. If I had to give the talk a title, it would be Church Membership in the Spirit versus Church Membership in the Power. Uh, no doubt many people have been attending this parish for quite a while, and uh, they haven't been uh, what, what we would say is official members. They are not baptized or confirmed or uh, even admitted according to the church's admission ceremony. Uh, they just attend and receive the Eucharist and the healing services or other services of the church when they're held. And in a sense, uh, these attendees are what we could call members in the spirit. Uh, this is, I think, inculcated within the liberal Catholic Church uh, due to a few factors. Uh, one factor is the fact that our church has open communion, which means that anybody can visit our church and receive the Eucharist, uh, whether or not they are a member of this particular church, the liberal Catholic Church, or any Catholic Church, or any Christian Church. They can receive the Eucharist even if they're not baptized, if they're a member of another religion, or if they're a member of no religion. We have just open communion. Another distinctive of the liberal Catholic Church is that we emphasize intellectual freedom, which means that uh, none of the dogmas of traditional Christianity are expected to be believed of the members of our church. So each member is supposed to work out his own belief system, his or her own belief system, uh, according to the light of their reason and their own experimentation and personal spiritual experience. Now our church does have specific teachings uh, regarding various issues of Christian practice and, and belief, but these are not uh, enforced upon the membership of the church. So you can be baptized or confirmed in this church, but you don't have to believe specific things about Jesus or God even. You can have your own personal beliefs, your own personal interpretation of the Christian religion. Another contributing factor to what I think leads many liberal Catholics to uh, treat the issue of church membership as though it's a matter of indifference or it's of definitely not of importance is an overall attitude uh, and belief that you see now becoming very popular in the in the wider culture which is this concept of you know well i'm spiritual but i'm not religious and this will often involve people saying, well, you know, I don't need to go to a church. I don't need to be baptized or become a member or sign my name on a piece of paper. I can walk on the beach and God is there. Or I can walk in the forest or I can have my friends over for a nice dinner and some wine and cheese and the fellowship amongst us. That's what God is. I don't need to be religious as it is often said. Now, one of the things that I've always been struck by when people have this attitude towards religion is that it underlying it is, is an idea that whatever is non-material is spiritual. That, you know, just living my life is spiritual as long as I'm not living it, uh, you know, focused on materialism or material things. So whatever is non-material is considered spiritual. Well, I would like to argue today that that is, uh, there is some truth to that view, but it's not, in my opinion, the fullness of the truth. And the Christian is always called to live in the fullness of knowledge, in the fullness of of enlightenment. Now the liberal Catholic Church is different than say Roman Catholic or Orthodox churches which require baptism and require confirmation to participate in the other sacraments. And as I said in the liberal Catholic Church, you can participate in our sacraments without 
being baptized or confirmed. And this leads, I think, to an easy belief that church membership is a kind of ephemeral issue and is not really essential in any way or important. And so what I would like to argue this morning is that church membership involves more than an issue of your spirit, that it involves the realm of power. And this power comes about for Catholics, for us liberal Catholics, in the sacramental life. And this sacramental life is an empowered life. Well, what is an empowered life? Perhaps the best way to begin to examine this is to look at the Eucharist. Now, the Eucharist is viewed by many as a symbolic ceremony or as a memorial meal. But within the Catholic tradition, and the liberal Catholic Church is within the Catholic tradition, the Eucharist is viewed as the real presence of Christ that you are taking into your body the very body and blood of Christ. Now, this is obviously for the materially minded a quite perplexing teaching, and it has, of course, caused quite a bit of controversy in the history of Christianity. Well, what is this real presence? Well, if we look at the Gospel of John in the sixth chapter, John tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is a text in Christianity that's considered one of Jesus's greatest miracles. Now, one of the things we have to be careful of, though, is this whole concept of a miracle. Jesus, in many places in the Gospels, says that he is not going to provide us miracles or signs, and that it is a definite sign of weakness to need to rely on a miracle to have faith and for one, in order for one to believe. But nonetheless, this is often this feeding of the 5,000 is often called a miracle. And what is interesting about this miracle, if we put quotes around the word, is that it is the only one that is included in all four of the Gospels. And in John's version of the feeding of the 5,000, the bread is blessed by Jesus and then it is distributed to the multitudes by the disciples. And the disciples come back. The, originally, there were five loaves of bread, and these five loaves, after they have been blessed by Jesus, are able to feed 5,000 people or more. And then all of the fragments of the bread are collected, and they fill 12 large baskets. So what is going on here? Well, if we look at the 12 baskets, symbolically, they represent the apostles, the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles. They represent the apostolic blessing, the apostolic power, because the disciples, the apostles, have been the mediators between Jesus and the multitudes. And in this mediatorship, after it is all done and the multitudes have been fed, the 12 baskets are full of the fragments that are left over, which implies that this bread has no limit. There is no limit to this heavenly bread. And the church has understood the feeding of the 5,000 historically as uh, a teaching about the Eucharist. Now, many readers of the Bible will say, well, I don't really see that in there. I just see a, a, either a nice story or I see a miracle story dealing with the fact that spiritual blessings have no limitations. And that is true. But the story is actually saying more than that. And so after it is completed, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus sends the multitudes away. He tells the disciples to get into a boat and cross over the sea or the lake that they are nearby. And then he himself goes to a mountain to pray. 
And then the disciples, while they are out on the sea, there is what is described as a contrary wind and stormy seas, and they become frightened, and they call out for help. And Jesus appears to them, and they think that it's an apparition, some kind of ghost or spirit. And then Jesus, in John's Gospel, says, It is I, have faith, do not fear, it is I. And then the, the seas are calmed, and Jesus enters the boat, and they complete the journey across the water. Now John's Gospel, after this incident, has Jesus discoursing with his disciples about what happened with the bread and the feeding of the 5,000. And the disciples say, well, what is going on here? And Jesus then gives them this fairly long discourse about the fact that he is the bread and that he will feed the soul of his disciples. But then he goes on even further, and he seems to complicate things for his disciples, because he tells them that you must eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and you must drink his blood. And some of the disciples get a little bit taken aback by this, and they say, well, this is difficult for us. And so beginning at verse 61, the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, hearing it, said, This saying is hard, and who can hear it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Doth this scandalize you? If then you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? So what Jesus has done here is they have questioned this teaching of Jesus that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And I should also remind my audience here this morning that the specific language that he uses, the, the word in Greek that he uses when he says eat the flesh, is a quite unique word in Greek. And it, it doesn't just, you know, in English we can say he consumed something, and it doesn't necessarily mean that he took it into his mouth. We can also say that somebody ate something, and it can have a symbolic meaning, which doesn't mean that he actually ate it with his mouth and swallowed it into his stomach. But the Greek word that Jesus uses when he says, eat the flesh, is a word that literally means chew. And in its most literal translation means to tear with the teeth. And most likely this word was chosen in Greek to leave no doubt in the reader's mind that this specific aspect of Jesus' teaching regarding the heavenly bread is referring to something physical, not just spiritual. Now, this doesn't mean that the overall message of Jesus' discourse regarding the heavenly bread isn't uh, related to the fact that the spiritual is definitely more important than the material, than the flesh. However, the fact is, is that the flesh, the material realm, is not to just be completely discarded. So when the disciples question Jesus and he offers them a proof, it's often not noticed, but the proof that he offers for this teaching, you know, he doesn't really get into heavy metaphysics or anything. He just says, or science or anything like that, and tries to explain to them how it is that they can chew his flesh by eating bread. The proof that he offers is his ascension. For he says, If then ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, and then he continues, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. And that verse right there has been the basis of much controversy in the history of the Christian church. Because that verse is often used to say, yes, you see, Jesus is talking about a spiritual bread, the flesh profiteth nothing. And uh, Catholics and Protestants have argued this issue over the centuries since the Protestant churches were formed. And Protestants have said, yes, this is just a teaching about spiritual bread. And Catholics have said, no, it's a teaching about the Eucharist. It's a teaching about uh, the physical bread, 
becoming, being transformed into the body of Jesus during the Eucharist. But what I'd like to focus on this morning is the fact that what Jesus says afterwards. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. That's an interesting addition there, spirit and life. We're so used to being caught in a kind of dualism, even though we think we're spiritual. It's the spirit versus the flesh. But what I'd like to suggest this morning is what Jesus has just said here is that there's something beyond spirit called the life. And another word for it I would use this morning is the power. The spirit flesh concept is so common to us, but I would like to remind you this morning that it is a dualism. When you start thinking about things in terms of flesh and spirit, material and spirit, then what happens is, is what I mentioned a few minutes ago, which is that whatever, there's a danger in that, because then whatever is not material is viewed as therefore spiritual. But there's something else that's involved in the path of being a Christian. And it is this issue of empowerment. When we look at the feeding of the 5,000 in John, we see this discourse about I am the heavenly bread. But as I mentioned already, this feeding of the 5,000 also occurs in the other three Gospels. And it's interesting what occurs in these other three versions. So in Matthew, in the 14th chapter, he tells the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And different from John, who has Jesus just appear to the disciples as a group and tell them as a group, you know, do not fear, it is I. Matthew has the same incident. The disciples are out on the water. The sea and the winds are against them. They become frightened. They call out. And it's Peter who walks out onto the water to go to Jesus. And then, of course, he sinks because he begins to lose his faith and become afraid. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. And then after this incident, Peter tells Jesus that you are the Christ. Now, when we go over to Mark's gospel, in chapter 6, again, we have the same incident. This time, we do not have Peter going out onto the water. Similar to John, we have Jesus just telling the disciples as a group that I am not an apparition, be not afraid, it is I, it is really Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 9, there's no story of the disciples in the boat at all. So Jesus feeds the 5,000, and then right after that, the disciples are sent away, the, the multitudes are sent away, and then the next episode in Luke's gospel is Jesus gathers his disciples around and he says, who do they say that I am? And that's a discourse, you know, some say, well, Lord, some say that you're John the Baptist and some say that you're Elijah and so forth. But what is interesting about these other three gospel accounts, other than John, that were called the synoptics, is that they're all giving you different data. You know, they give you the same story of the feeding of the 5,000, but then they all have this different conclusion to them. But there's an interesting thing to notice about those different conclusions. Those conclusions all center around one thing, the identity of Jesus as Christ. And this is why it's important to remember the fact that in all of the accounts, the disciples, when they're on the troubled sea, look out and they see what they think is an apparition. In other words, their vision, their understanding is kind of clouded. They're not seeing quite clearly. And then Jesus has to reveal to them, it is me. So all of these accounts deal with the identity of Jesus, emphasizing it in different ways with different stories, different data. But it's the same overarching idea, the identity of Jesus, within what is this narrative occurring? The feeding of the 5,000 with the bread. And that's why it's so important to look to what John says about the bread 
because in many ways he's being the most specific. Where Jesus actually says, you must eat my flesh, you must drink my blood. It is clear that this is a story which is meant to be interpreted Eucharistically as the Eucharist. It should also be noticed this morning, I hope everyone will take away this point, that when Protestants and Catholics and other people argue that Catholicism in many ways is this sort of late corruption of Christianity, of the simple gospel of Jesus, I would just like to point out the fact that this issue of the feeding of the 5,000, this, this scene, this miracle, all four gospels tell this story in relation to Jesus' identity being revealed and this identity is revealed in the bread, in the feeding of the people with the bread. And in case there's any other confusion about this issue, in Mark's gospel it even says after uh, Jesus tells them, it is I, and then he kind of concludes the whole scenario by saying, for the disciples did not understand concerning the loaves. In other words, what had just occurred on the sea and the whole aspect of not recognizing Jesus is related to the feeding with the loaves. And they did not, as Mark says, they did not understand concerning the loaves. They did not divine his identity yet in the loaves. It should also be noticed that there are multitudes and disciples in this story. And once Jesus feeds the multitudes, he sends them away. And then the disciples are told to get on a ship, on a boat, and to go to the other shore. And if we follow our liberal Catholic tradition, which is to interpret Scripture in a very uh, spiritual manner, to look for the allegories and the spiritual meaning which lies behind more literalistic readings. As we look at this, the disciples then are told to get on this boat, and they are going to the other shore, which means towards enlightenment, towards union with Jesus the Christ and God. And in this process, Jesus goes up to the mountain by himself to pray. So they are away from Jesus. And then this is when the contrary winds and the stormy seas come, and they call out for help, and Jesus comes into their midst. And it is only when he comes into their midst and identifies himself, the seas are calmed, and they are able to finish and go over to the other shore. And so this teaches us that it is this Christ in our midst that enables us to complete our journey. It is the presence of Christ. It is not just the spiritual knowledge and understanding, because they'd already just received that. They were already just with Jesus. But then once he's not in their presence, the contrary winds and the storms come. And it's when they call out for him that his presence comes. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Jesus will appear. The Christ will appear. The presence. The feeding of the 5,000 is a revelation of the identity of Christ. Not by miracle, but the power of his presence. Now, the bread is spiritual, and it does cultivate in us the presence of Christ outside of the altar as well. It's not like the only time you can have Jesus is if you're taking the Eucharist. That's why there's multitudes and disciples. The multitudes receive the bread as well. They just don't receive the fullness of the understanding of who Jesus is. I should also note that after the incident on the boat, the, all the Gospels have, well, not all the Gospels, I don't think John's has this, but I know Matthew's does, and I believe Mark's as well, has this account of the fact that then 
Jesus and the disciples finish the journey, get to the other shore, and then it is said that those who are round about are called to Jesus. They know that Jesus has arrived. It's also uh, implied that they were part of the original people who were fed, and they've like kind of went searching for Jesus, and they found where he's at now, and now they've come once again. And it's interesting also to note that it says that they then gathered around and were able just to heal themselves and to receive his blessing by touching his outer garment, the, the edge of his garment, it is said, which symbolizes the fact that now that they've received partial enlightenment, they've gotten some empowerment, and now they have went searching for Jesus, and now they've gotten closer to him, but they're still not disciples yet, and this is symbolized in the touching of the outer garment. They're still essentially the multitudes, but now they're drawing closer. They're getting closer to becoming disciples. So as I said, the bread is spiritual, and it does cultivate this presence of Christ outside of the altar. So what is it? If we look at a great figure of early Christianity, his name was Origen of Alexandria, lived in the third century, and was a voluminous writer and a spiritual guide, and an influence on the spirituality of the Orthodox Church and many of the monastic traditions in the West as well. And in one of his most influential works called On Prayer, Origen examines the Lord's Prayer. And he points out a very interesting thing, that the, the mention in the Lord's Prayer of the daily bread is a very strange choice of words. The word is really not used by the Greek philosophers, the word that is translated as daily. It's not really used by the Greek philosophers, and it's not really used by the, by the playwrights either. In Origen does some examining of the roots of the word, of the root of the word, and the closest that he can come to finding uh, an equivalent is in the Old Testament where it's, Moses records that God makes a statement that he is going to make the, the people his possession. And by using this concept of the possession, Origen is able to look at the word and he translates it as being. So instead of saying, give us our daily bread, it's saying, give us the bread of our being. And as I said, in English, this word daily is uh, really, not, it's not just strange, it's highly inadequate. Because we usually use the word daily to mean things like, I'm doing my daily chores. It tends to mean mundane. Daily means nothing special. It's the normative. So it's actually a, a, not a very good word. Because then what we do is we look at it, especially if you're from a Protestant background, you look at that phrase daily bread and you say, yes, our lunch, our dinner, the food that keeps us alive every day, give us our daily sustenance. And as Origen points out, the word really means, has the connotation of being. Now, more modern biblical scholars have pointed out, and, and the Roman Catholic Church knew this quite a long time ago as well, that the word also translates as uh, beyond being or super substantial, more than the substance. And so if you have a Dewey Reams Catholic New Testament, you can see this translated in Matthew. Instead of saying daily bread, it will actually say, give us this day our super substantial bread, which of course means a lot more than your daily bread, as we understand it in English. But all of this, super substantial, above the essence, being, it means that something quite magical is occurring with the bread. And so, yes, this bread is not just the Eucharistic bread, but the Eucharistic bread is an archetype. It is a reminder, and it is a frequent day, well, not daily for most Catholics today, but at least a weekly reminder of what our being is. Give us this day the bread of our being, who we are. Because we are the image of God. 
And Christ is that mediator that enables that image to be rediscovered, to be reformulated. In this sense, the Eucharist is really a magical thing. It is an empowerment. It is a transmutation. It is a change of our being. So when we're taking this Eucharist, and it says, you know, in memory of me as a memorial, there is a memorial aspect of it. It's reminding us of who we are and what our being is. And this being is God. We also are sons of God. We also will ascend as Jesus mentioned when he gave proof for his bread of life discourse, we will ascend as well to that other shore with Christ in our presence. And before I conclude here, I would like to just mention that this empowerment of the Eucharist is found in all of the sacraments. Baptism is an initiation and an empowerment. Confirmation is an initiation and an empowerment. You are given the oil on your forehead, the oil of chrism, the Christ oil. Christ means anointed with oil. It means the oiled one. The oil sealed one is what Christ means. We are Christ's. We have been sealed if we are confirmed with this oil. When we receive healing, the oil is placed upon our flesh. These are empowerments. These empowerments move us from the multitudes outside of the church into discipleship. They move us from being members of the church in the body. And by the way, Catholic means universal. All people are in the church. Whether they know it or not, all people are in the church. The whole universe is the church. So everything is a member of the church in the body. But then there are those aspects of the multitudes of the universe who become members in the spirit. They understand that there's more to life than just the physical. That there are higher things, higher thoughts, higher feelings. And they move towards those. They gather around the outer garment. But then there are those who become disciples, who decide to go under a discipline and follow the Christ to call the Christ into their presence so that they can walk on water, so that they can heal the sick and raise the dead, so that they can be in the power. So my challenge or my suggestion for you this morning is to follow this liberal Catholic tradition of experimentation, this liberal Catholic position that says that you should try out things for yourself and see if they work. Try out church membership. If you haven't been baptized, be baptized, see what happens. If you haven't been confirmed, be oiled, be chrismated, see what happens. Even the ceremony of membership, of admission into the church, although it's not a sacrament, it has a laying on of hands. It has an empowerment. Try it. Draw near. Call the Christ into your presence and see what happens in your life. If there is really, as I say, a difference between being a member in the Spirit and a member in the power. I'll just conclude by saying that the liberal Catholic Church was founded as a special channel 
It was founded as a way to bring the more esoteric and spiritual understandings of Christianity out into the open, to make them available to people, to sort of resurrect them after they had been buried by centuries of more literalistic and dogmatic interpretations and understandings. This liberal Catholic Church itself was specially empowered for what I think is a special mission in the world. And that is another reason why I would ask you to reconsider your membership in the church, to become a member of this particular channel of God's work, the liberal Catholic Church. All of the historic sacraments of the church, but understood spiritually, esoterically, understood in the power. And see what happens. See the transformation in your life as you take that Eucharist in week after week and you feel the transmutation. Try it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, three persons in one God, be ascribed all honor, might, majesty, power, and dominion, now and forevermore. Amen.